Quick question. 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 All right, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Quick Question. I'm Jonathan Sadowski. I am Travis Clark. Ladies and gentlemen, season two. We have guests. We sure do. Uh, today, we have, uh, we have the pleasure of being joined by one of my personal friends. Uh, Travis, you've met him. Uh, he's sitting <laughs> right in front of me. What a weird way to put me into the conversation. <laughs> Travis, you've met We're him. We're here with my friend and uh, also my co-host. Uh, you may know him from uh, every hit song ever. He's the person that wrote it, uh, including Same Old Love by Selena Gomez. He wrote Dangerous Woman for Ariana Grande. The list goes on and on and on. He's also the creator and host of the Platinum Podcast, and the writer is... And the writer is... Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the Quick Question Studio, Ross Golan. Hey, Ross! Hey, da, 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 uh, da, first and da, foremost, da, da, Ross, yeah, uh, yes. welcome to the Quick Question Studio. Here's a bag of oranges. What? Oh, yeah. my goodness! Right off the bat, I want to say you were Thank you. interrupting what, what is probably our new hit theme song that he was that, playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was writing a new Welcome, Ross. Hey, guys. Thanks for doing the show. Yeah, So, of course. Um, here's how we usually do this. Uh, we ask a question and then uh, a conversation. It's a seed, if, if you will, of a conversation. Now, I guess I, I have been defaulted as the you, question You are the questionnaire. Ross, you have... That, 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 that. What? What's the name of our show? Quick question. Hey, Ross, quick question. <laughs> <laughs> this is perfect in terms of what my question is going to be. Okay. So, Ross, you have collaborated with many, many uh, platinum-selling artists. You yourself, I hear, are a perfectionist. So, Ross, quick, quick question. question. How do you work... With a perfectionist, how do you deal with compromise? Oh, that's interesting. I, th you know, it's crazy. It's m my job, um, my job is facilitating my co-writer's best work. Interesting. My job isn't to be the star. There are times where I write one hundred percent of melodies and lyrics, but that doesn't make me. It, it's the the purpose of me doing that in the moment is to make sure that the artist has something that they want to say in a certain way. So they still walk away feeling like it's their song. Giving ownership is huge. And so, but, but you're still listed, what well, you're listed as like a producer then or, or co-writer or how, how do you, or does that just vary thing it, to thing? It all varies thing to thing, but, but regardless of what it is, I have a, I'm working on a project where the director says to me, um, he says his job is to manage expectations. <laughs> That's hysterical. <laughs> and he's got he's got he's got casts around the world right now doing shows that um, he needs to. His job is to manage expectations, and I feel like in a room and as a collaborator, my job is to, on some level, manage expectations. But it's it's. That's why I always say it's to facilitate the other person's best song. But when they be, but when they bring you on, aren't you the other person? Like like if if Pink or Michael Bublé, they bring you sure. to write a song for yeah. them. And, yeah. And you think the best version is not what they think. Where's the compromise there? Well, first of all, it's whatever's best for the song, right? I'm I'm totally fine saying that I'm uh, my idea. If if I walk in. Think of it like this. If there are three of us, that means that 33% of the song needs to be my ideas. That would be an equal split. Interesting. So okay. if I walk in there and, I'm, and I start... I mean, that's know, just straight up math. You're 100% correct. <laughs> right. yeah. I don't know why I said interesting. That just checks out <laughs> factually, actually, if I think about but it. But that's the thing. I'll be put, in a, put, I'll, put the calculator up away. <laughs> <in the laughs> hold on. Hold on. Um, uh, Ross's math checks out. Uh, actually, I believe it's 33.3 if I checked... Uh, With a little line over yeah, it. Right. Well, repeating. But this is the real thing, right? I have, I have songs where there are six writers on it. And so if I have 16.67% of the song... Holy shit, you did do the still, math. It's still the same thing, that my job is to facilitate all their best songs. Some of this is a survival of the fittest technique. And I, and I think everyone in art who deals with other humans should do this. Their job 
is to make everyone around them talk about how excited they are about their project. Let me tell you how so, that varies in acting. Well, no, <laughs> no, no, but on some level, in yes, some of that's true. But as a as a, a screenwriter and as a producer and as a director, if 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 I were to create a show and every person who's a part of the show walks around L.A. or New York or wherever and says, I, are so excited because they feel like it's their show. That's the best way that that show wins. So and so if I can do that with every single song and every album and every musical, that I make sure that my the people I work with walk around saying, let me tell you about this project I'm working on, and that they can take ownership in it, that's what's going to make... That's what's going to make that win. That's how I'm going to get the project to succeed, and that's how I'm going to succeed as a writer and as someone in this industry as a whole. In my opinion, I think that that's, that's a big part of the job. Yeah, you know, so we, like, as an actor, and I'm sure you've come across this too, and Travis, you have in, in the comedy world, obviously... There's uh, a thing. There's a little thing we like to refer to as ego. I, that's where I was going to go with there's this. There's a little I was... thing we call ego here. And I know, and I've done this before too, as an actor on set. You know, uh, a director will come in, or or someone will give me a note, and I'm just like, I'm not going to do that. I simply will not do that. Does that ever happen in the songwriting world, where there's like, where someone wants something to happen in the process, and it's just, uh, it goes against every bane, every grain of your. Of your being. It goes against every bane of your existence. <laughs> <laughs> 95% of the time, and I would say, I would say, well, let's give it a shot. Let's see if it's better. Oh, let them fail. Let their idea die on the vine. My job. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's because my job is to facilitate their best song. Right. So if they walk in and they say, try it this way. And I go and I say, I don't know if that works because this is the math. Because I, I always think, and we can get into this in a second, because this is where I think our lives are analogous. It's not in the acting world. Great word. But mm, great um, word. Today's I, word is analogous. analogous. Right. But my, um, <laughs> if I can. Today's episode is brought to you by the word analogous. Analogous. It means. I don't know what it means, but it sounds cool. You actually Medical. used that word in a lyric before <laughs> for oh, glacier sure, hiking. For sure. How is that for analogous? I like that. No, that's your yeah, lyric. That's true. Huh? Yeah. Well, here's here's something. Um, before, you know, not to go off on a tangent, but oh, that please. I, that's all not, this that's show all we is. do. Right. That, well, my my <laughs> the show should be called Long Tangent. Quick question. <laughs> Quick question. <laughs> Quick sounds, like, sounds like a Native American name. Uh, welcome to. Quick question, long tangent. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do the voice. Don't I'm not going to do the voice. Don't do I'm it. just going <laughs> to... Yes, and. And Ross, we were saying. So I always say that my job is much closer to a magician. I think what that I do... That you lie to people with flair. Yeah. <laughs> That's hysterically funny. 100%. <laughs> I know how you... Right. So a, a magician, their job... If they're good at what they do, they know how you see. Right. And they know how you think. Because they can they can now manipulate how you see by pulling your attention in different ways. And you sit there and you think it's magic. Well, my job is to know how you hear. So as a songwriter, I know how to manipulate you regardless of whether you like the song. Oh I can God. pull you from the first note to the last. Do we have a sound effect for I've my done... mind being blown? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm going to question every fucking song I hear from so now on. If I, I go and I when I teach students, and we talk about it a lot in, in And the Writer Is, the podcast... Available on of, iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Spotify, and uh, any place you can find you uh, uh, po podcasts. I think of what I do is uh, I'm much more of an illusionist. So if I know how you want to resolve a certain melody, per se, I know that I can manip manipulate you rhythmically and melodically to expect a certain resolution in a melody. So, for example, let's say it was... Um, Hey Jude, this is one of my common examples. If you go na 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 na, hey Jude, it would be done because you would have resolved the last right. Note. But it goes hey five, right? Five is a it's a musical expression right. for the for the note in the so, scale. So you have <laughs> yes, to it is. so you have to wait for the beginning of the next the the next measure. 
Na 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 na. Hey Jude. Na 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 na. Ah, interesting. So that's that's a, a Bach technique. That's a. This is something that music has been doing in Western music for a long time. It's an audio cliffhanger. Right. So Great. if I can, if I can, <laughs> let take take the. So there are a few things to to this. If if you are, if I know how you listen now, I can, I can mess with you with where the resolution is. I can play with the rhythm. So you know, by having the next thing start on the one, that's messing with your mind. You're expecting the resolution to come on the four, just because you know you were born singing A B C D E F G. H I J K right. L M N O P. Now, now and that resolves right there. Right. There's L-M-N-O-P. tons of there's there's obviously like there's m- like millions of songwriters out in the world. Right. Don't they all know this technique? No. <laughs> no, because what you're telling me is the psychology behind songwriting. Right. Which is basically you are. It's like it's okay. I'm gonna. I'm not a poker player, but as I understand poker, it's like you're not really playing with the hand the that cards. you have. You're playing against everybody else. That's right. And you're you're basically learning how to influence. That's them. right. I mean, that's look, amazing. There are a lot of people who can do magic tricks. Once you learn magic, a lot of people can do magic tricks. Right. There are people right. who do better and better tricks. And part of my job is to make it so other songwriters look at the magic trick. They might know how it's done, but they're impressed because they didn't think of that. That's how. You yeah. Do. Yeah. And that's the same thing I think in any art form where you're like you'll watch something and you're like oh I see what they did there. Fuck! Why didn't I think yes. of that? You so know, form in a movie the. The way certain somebody does an accent, the way you know dialogue works, where you're like, oh, that's quippy, that's what you know. People choose to manipulate the viewer, and people just don't think of music. They think of music in a really obscure way. In all other art, nobody thinks that Meryl Streep writes her own her <laughs> own lyrics. That's very true. Like, but every, everybody's like, everybody thinks every musical artist writes their own shit. Which is just fucking false. Right. It's, it's just, and it's yeah. never been the case. It hasn't been the case ever. I mean, when... Well, the Beatles. Yeah, but they start, still started with... It, they started... Their first album was half covers, and they were naturally doing covers. They're great writers. They changed the music industry. But my point being that when you think of... Let's go back to classical examples, because I think a lot of people... If you tell me Bach didn't write his own music, I'm going to lose my shit. No, I'm not... <laughs> I'm not going to say that, but but you think of if, if why don't people he had a mock look? Writer. Why don't people look at orchestras? Oh why don't they look at um, the LA Philharmonic as a cover band? Oh, because they are. You're 100 percent right. Band. They're a they're, they're a they're cover like band. The, they're the hardest cover band to get into. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and and talent wise, it it's really smart, but they are not creating their material, and no nobody questions that. So let but, me ask let me ask you a question. I'm going to take you back a little bit. Sure. Here. Back it um, up. When did you start writing songs? I, I I probably the first song I really wrote was probably when I was 14, and then the first song I wrote that. That was actually oh that that might actually be something. I was probably about fifteen. Wow! So it only took you a year to master it to become an audio mm, illuminati. No, I would say <laughs> the when I first moved out here, I, I would say kind of like say I wrote art. my first song at fourteen. My, my first number one was like fourteen and a half. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> I work with people who are. Re- I worked with somebody who just turned nineteen last week, and oh. you know she's. Unbelievable. How? How? She's, she's great. I mean, and she got her record deal when she was 14. So one of, the, one of the things that she said that's very accurate is that often people look at someone who's young and they think, well, how are they so successful s- starting at that age? Right. Because they put themselves, and but they they're not. they realize they've been doing They've this. been working. She's been working professionally since she was 14. So she has five years of experience. That's the bulk of my... My co-writing. So, like, experience. let me let me qu- ask you a question. Like, uh, where where does the does age come into play in in the recording studio? Like, when if you if you saw a nineteen year old kid walk in, or a, like even take a sixteen year old kid walk in, and you're supposed to collaborate with them, is there a party that goes, yeah, this fucking kid? Like, what the hell do they know? My job is to facilitate their best song. That's a very political And that's answer. why he is going to be elected to mayor of music. <laughs> <laughs> mayor I mean, of music, Bill. But 
look, I go and I talk to Congress. I go and I speak on behalf of musicians in for you know I, I work with the NMPA, the National Music Publishers Association. I work with the Grammy Board. I work with you know I've I've met. A I lot was like of the Notion Picture Association <laughs> of America. <laughs> notion, <laughs> notion, notion picture. This was the notion I was going for yeah. when I took this picture. <laughs> and that's you know my I I try to make sure that people recognize that it is a moving art form. And if I go in there with the mindset of what does this kid know, I can guarantee you that that session is not going to work out. I have worked with someone who's 14 before who said, you know, why is, I remember him saying, why is Beyonce famous? And you're like, well, you know, I mean, Destiny's Child. And he do, didn't do you remember. Want me, do I have to answer this question? And he didn't, he didn't remember Destiny's Child. Oh, he's 14. He, I he's couldn't. 14. <laughs> yeah. And he, he was literally an infant. Think yeah. about, think about it like this, right? If, from when you were born to from now to when Nirvana was big. Uh, Nirvana. Oh, don't is, get me now you're talking Travis's language. Is from when you were born to essentially Led Zeppelin. Uh, no, no. No. Led Zeppelin came out in like nineteen sixty five or something like that. When you were born in nineteen seventy nine, Ross. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and but, edit point. And edit point. But, <laughs> but on some level, what, what is it, 92, 91 is when... Nirvana so 26 broke. 26 yep. years before that. So 26 years, so you're at, uh, where are we at, 73 to uh, 53. So we're talking about, that's before South Pacific. That's before, I'm going to wash that man right out of my hair was a number one song. That's insanity. That's, that's how old it is. That when what happens is I think people think during their lifetime they forget how long ago. That's, but you know what? Blew- you never listened to music from 1953. Even the doo wopiest songs were mostly after that. Right. This is bo- that's before Johnny Cash broke. Johnny wow. Cash hadn't written Folsom Prison Blues yet. Well, you know, and it, it's, it's funny. It's like I I was uh, I think I, met, I don't know if I mentioned this to you or. Someone else, but I was like, you know, uh, I was in the car. I forget who I was with, but they had like no idea what this band was, and I was like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" But I'm realizing it's like when me and you and Travis, when we're in the car and we're listening to Pearl Jam or Nirvana or Counting Crows or the Gin Blossoms, that's the equivalent of our parents listening to oldies. Yeah, no, and this is the part that you know because your parents weren't listening to music that old. Your parents would have only been twelve. The, yeah, Motown, I was 12 when Nirvana no, 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 came no. out. Mo, but my point being that, like... No, the, I'm talking about, right. like, like, oldies, you know? But it, my my point is that when we think of oldies often, I think people think Motown. And the bulk of Motown is late 60s, early 70s. That means that, that that's the equivalent of Destiny's Child. To oh, you. yeah, yeah. That's how recent it is from when you were born. I'm just I'm saying thinking like what what but I I am 60. So uh, <laughs> he looks yeah, great yeah, for his I'm, age. I'm, I'm, I'm but, very old. But it's important to look at it like that that the same no, distance, it, it, and it, I, yeah. I'm not going to call you out on your age but I'm going to say that I'm not really 60. No, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I know that but you're still talking about, you know, songs that came out, you know, essentially right after World War II. Yeah. As the right. equivalent of of from when right now, now from people who are born right okay, now. Okay, so to from Nirvana. from a songwriting standpoint, do you think it's important for aspiring songwriters to be well versed in that music? I mean, do you think they need to go back that that far? I try to to. I have five writers signed to me. We go, you know, I, I when people sign to me, it's because I tell them this is going for your masters and your doctorate in composition, and not about you know, getting cuts placed and all that. Like, you can choose different kinds of publishers. But my job is to educate a little bit on composition. And composition hasn't changed all that much since Schubert in 1835 or whatever. Because it, you're talking about the oh, same... Oh, Schubert. Co- Sh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Watch but- out, it's a Schubert. <laughs> it's a Schubert. Is that like a ring bear? It's, yeah. like, yeah, it's like a ring bear. Ring bear. Yeah. Um, do you know, wait, real quick, si- yeah, yeah. Uh, side note, as yeah. we often do. Yes, sir. Um, we had... Uh, uh, way back, I forget whose wedding it was, but there was a wedding I was going to back in Chicago. Oh god! And uh, and there was this little kid who thought he, it was the ring bear. So as he yeah, brought as he brought the pillow with the ring, <laughs> he gave it to he gave it to like the the best man. And he goes rawr. Yeah. 
<laughs> so good. The ring bear. Oh, boy. I have a question going along the lines of uh, perception or even maybe even bias within the arts. We were talking about the L.A. Philharmonic earlier. Yes. I remember uh, being at the Hollywood Bowl once when they were setting up for the um, fireworks. I had a friend who was doing all of that. And I saw the bad boy of cello pull up. Do we need a Yo-Yo bad Ma? boy? No, no. This, like, oh, I thought that was like a nickname you gave Yo-Yo Ma. I, no, this was like a <laughs> dude who looked like he would have been a bad guy and die hard. Like long oh, wow. blonde hair, cello on, like as a backpack riding up on his motorcycle to get off and come up and like be the bad boy of cello. Wow. And I'm like, do we need that? Yes. Am, am I? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, music will stay the same if we go and we start thinking music was good, if you knew when music was good. Nothing will make you sound older. Right. Nothing will make you sound less relevant, and nothing will make you sound more But no, he's, more play, wrong. he's showing up playing classical music on his motorcycle. Yeah, he should. <laughs> he should go in and have identity. Find, I think it's a little novelty. Find an I- <laughs> no, it, maybe, but find an identity. All covers are. He All is co- a cover covers. band. You're right, he is a cover band. He, All covers yeah, he's, are, the, he's the front. He's the front I cellist. Go, <laughs> if I go and I cover a song that you guys know in the room, and you've seen me do it a thousand times with a couple songs, you know that that's a novelty experience for everyone in the room. Yeah. They see this white Jewish kid playing whatever songs. Yeah, and, and you know, and I got I got to tell you, Ross. I know uh, he's a buddy of yours, but I'm a little, I'm a little let down with with uh, Rivers Cuomo. Uh oh! Why he covered Weezer covering Africa by oh, Toto? Oh, I like that. Did you really? I did. Well, yeah, I like that actually, song. I like the song. Made Billboard yeah. Hot 100 list. Did it really? Yeah. Oh man, that's like one of those songs that just like you don't remake that song. Why? Because you know? I think it's 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 as close to a flawless song as you can get. Here's here's this is the difference. This is the difference in collaboration when it comes to ego and not. I I don't work with anybody who has an ego. I don't. How is that possible? I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's true. You no, John's literally, he left the room. He's running. Yeah, exactly. Bye, John. Um, after 20 years of friendship, that's how it ends. You just hear this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, if somebody walks in with an, with an ego, it'll probably be the last time I work with you. I remember, I remember hearing a story about a, a young kid like that who you kind of punted to the fucking side. Yeah, but, and, the, and because it was the, you, you come in with an ego, you're out. And I work with people who are essentially the Mozart of pop songwriting. Like, I, I work with the top writers in history. And they don't have ego or they Zero. do? Wow. You Amazing. Walk, you walk in that room with an ego... You're out. I came in here uh, having an ego about how to set up this room. So, the, I mean, right off the bat, I'm the difficult. The whole idea of saying no is the first rule of how not to collaborate. Okay, but let me... Let me I let me. never... Even if I know the answer is no, my job is to make that other person find out why it should be an, a no. Explain, this is what I think. And, and to be honest, there are times where I am wrong. So if I go in and I say no, then we never hear it. But if I go in and I say yes, and if some of it I'm wrong, then I'm better for it. They're better for right. it. And but so there's no reason we've to We've had no. these talks before about like sampling other musicians and, and covers. I just think, and this is my personal opinion, there are certain bands like Weezer who I find incredibly talented. And they're so unique. And their songwriting style is, is so undoubtedly them. You know, when you hear Beverly Hills or you hear uh, If You Want to Do This or Buddy Holly, it's like, those are, those are Weezer, that's Weezer, you know? When I hear, do you want me to break your heart? Yeah. Do you want me to break yeah, your heart? Do it. Or no? do it, do it. Wow, well, now we're talking about Do you song. want me to break your heart? They didn't write them. Tell me they didn't write them. No, they did. No, they oh, did, but their cars rip offs. No, no, no. I, so I, I wrote with Rivers, and Rivers is great. I've written with Rivers a few times. We had, one of my first singles was a CeeLo song that I wrote with Rivers. So I, the guy's like an icon and, and a legend and a co-writer and a friend. Yep. The, he, w- we wrote one song kind of, you know, aiming for Weezer. And he was reading a book about Billy Joel and was listening through the arrangements. And a lot of the Billy Joel arrangements were really avant-garde because at the time in the mid-70s, the, if you had a shitty song to lead your album, 
no one would buy your your album. But what they could do is because brands were owning radio. If a band like someone like Billy Joel, who had a first, second, third, fourth single, that fifth, sixth, seventh singles were actually not very good songs. But we think fondly because it's yeah. Billy Joel and whatnot. But the idea is that these arrangements were really avant-garde. And so you'd have someone like Rivers, we're sitting there, we're mapping out arrangements of, of Billy Joel songs to write a song that's represents Holy that kind of... Holy shit, you're going that deep with it? Yeah. That's amazing. That's, so if, yeah. we're, if we're doing that, we're looking at chord changes, we're looking at all these things. What is right. it, Why is but, that... But that's hear an me inter- out. Hear me interpolation out. of sorts. It, it 100% is. And I respect that part of the process. I didn't know that was part of the process. I just... I, I don't know if I'm a fan of covers by a, by a, by a big band. Oh, well, covers are different. I you mean, know, I didn't covers even like, are fine. Like my when, problem when, with you is when you talk about sampling and you don't <laughs> recognize... <laughs> no, no, no. Hold on. I don't know this. What's, no, what's no. this argument? Okay, so, so there's a thought process amongst people who don't know how songwriting works <laughs> to look at... <laughs> that, was a, that was a fucking subtle, subtle yeah, exactly. cut at me. <laughs> to, to look at, at sampling as a way of, of judging music as being inferior. They look at like, well, there was a sample there, or it, there was an interpolation, or there was something, so they look down on it. Is it the same kind of thing as like, oh, uh, that DJ just presses a button. He doesn't have to know how to play yeah. anything. Yeah, it's a little bit like that. Um, but the idea is that, again, in the same way people look at, they don't expect Meryl Streep to write her own you know, script. I think she people, just shows up and says all of those things off the cuff. Yeah, exactly. Is that how it works? Uh, sometimes, <laughs> probably. She was just but, like, I like ABBA, and then Mamma Mia happened, oh my is God. what I think. But but the idea is people use sampling, right? Yeah. And my problem with it, again, is that it's really art-specific. When it's a Campbell soup can, they view it as art. When it's Quentin Tarantino, they view it as art. But when it's... It depends when on it's, the person. <laughs> but when it's... Um, when it's Tupac, it's a sample, so it's not as good. Or only over time, when Tupac means something different, then it's like, oh, well, then I get it. Are you referring to the Campbell Soup Can of Andy Warhol? Yes. Okay. So my point is that... <laughs> the, the Quentin Tarantino movie, yeah. Campbell Soup Can. <laughs> but that, this, is a, this is a truth. This is a truth about music that people somehow look at music in a very obscure lens. And I do think that there's a reason for it, you know... But nobody looks at food that way. Nobody thinks of people stealing food ideas as being like not like wow that. Oh my food god, is, I love t- I, I love the equivalent of food sampling. I love tapas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I go to I go to Costco on the weekends <laughs> simply to sample food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> simply for the samples. Oh. But I do think that's a that's a a very archaic way to listen to recorded music, which is only a hundred years old. To look at it and think that sampling, for some reason, is makes a song lesser, and instead, I think it's better to look at it in the way we view, you know, uh, a lot of television. So start that, looking at well, sampling as like as a, as a twist on an old class. Sure, but yes. you know who's really good at food sampling? Uh, Marky Mark and the Funky Brunch. Guys, I... Um, oh, no. Is it too much? Oh, my God. <laughs> what I happened? Even have a, I, I, <laughs> that, that took my fucking breath away. <laughs> oh, boy. No? Too much? I don't know I about that. No? Oh. No? All right. Oh, boy. Um, all right. So let's... like. So uh, if you had any advice to give uh, uh, an aspiring songwriter, um, what would it be? Oh, that's a question I ask on my podcast for my art people. No shit. Uh, it's almost like I listen to your podcast. Uh, it's almost. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I like w- we. One of the interviews that we had uh, was with Ryan Tedder, who's a singer from One Republic. One Republic, yeah. He just texted me while we were sitting here. Um, Tell Ryan I said hi. I will. He said. Um, Tell him I said fuck off. Yes. Just for fun. Perfect. Just to see what happens. Perfect. <laughs> Travis says fuck off. <laughs> Who? Who the fuck is yeah, Travis? Exactly. <laughs> exactly the right reaction. How funny would it be if you got into a feud with Ryan Tedder just because of this symbol? <laughs> so <laughs> weird. Um, but he said, he's, you know, proximity is a major part. Move to LA. It's that's it, huh? Move to Be close. You, you know, know, that's. I tell that people always ask me, like, I get direct messages and tweets and Facebook comments and stuff like that. What advice do you have to a young actor? And I say, yeah, move to and LA. I say, give up everything, move to LA, take an acting class, uh, take another yeah. acting class, take another acting class, 
audition for three years until you book a two-line role. Yeah. And then audition for another three years until you book a three-line role. Yep. <laughs> and if that's the life you want to lead, I say stick with it. Yeah. Right. You know? Same Do- thing. Same thing in songwriting. I think people want to. You know, there's that great expression. What you know, the the. Uh, I've heard 30 people have said it, but the what's advice you'd give a young actor and it's take, take fountain. fountain. That's uh, Betty Davis. Yeah. 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 Sure. And, uh, and that's the same, that's the same advice for a songwriter. In, in reality, you, you need to study, 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 and you need practice and you need to keep writing and keep writing so you can figure out why it doesn't work. Right. But this is one of the things, unlike television, where you have 250 channels with, you know, half of which, if not more, have new material being created. So there's there's opportunity. Not to mention all the streaming platforms. and Sure. Yeah. And in songwriting, stream, streaming aside, because that's a, a, a certain way of consumption, but there, our motto for the podcast is... There are millions of singers, there are thousands of artists, and there are only 40 songs per genre at a time. <laughs> right. And when you have 40 songs on the radio, that means that 15 of them are in heavy rotation, and those are, are the main ones that you get played, which is why on radio you have, um, why you tend to hear seemingly the same songs all the time. But you have those 15 songs, and then in between that you have commercials that re- create a lot of revenue for that radio station. Why are they going to put your song in between Kanye like proven, proven entities? Kanye and and you know Chance the Rapper and Ed Sheeran and they're going to go and put your new song in the middle of that rotation. For you to work your way into that, the song has to be better than all of them. That's why even proven names which is different than the 70s in some way you know, Gwen Stefani's last album, Britney Spears' last album, Beyonce's last album, no radio hits. Nothing, not yeah. one. You know, when you think of like, you you have a perception of what radio is when you're not looking at the charts, but you don't realize how difficult it is. Now, do you think that's, be, th- do you think that's partly, in that in, partly, do you think it's in part because it's like out with the old, in with the new kind of a thing? No. Well, yes, in songwriting, sure. I mean, you just said no. You just said no. I think I got him. You got him to say no. I got him. It happened. Song, (laughs) song wise, you're you're right that. um, I think styles like it's evolved. Like you said, it's an evolving art form, and and just like you know, the out with the old, in with the new. You know, ironically, you have you have songs like "Feel It Still," which use an eighty-five percent sample or interpolation with Mr. Postman. Um, and that you know becomes a number one song through. Wait, are you not supposed format. to say sample now? Is that like a bad word? No, an interpolation is different than a sample. What's the difference? A sam- I, I, I've never okay, heard so this. Okay, uh, so an interpolation is so when you watch a television show and they quote Godfather, and we just watch Billions, you know, the yeah, whole yeah. series, and they reference Godfather all, all the, time. the time. That would be the equivalent of an interpolation. So when Sam Smith gets sued by Tom Petty, it's not using the when word. when uh, um, uh, Chain Smokers with the Fray, when so all it- these songs, they there's somebody who's the whole problem with the Marvin Gaye estate is that they're going after really loose interpolation. So interpolation like- is a legal way to say homage. <laughs> Uh, it's like yes. a quote. It's, yeah. a, it's a it's, quote done by someone else. Whereas I would say a sample would be like the beginning of Ice Ice Baby, which is an actual lift. If you take the actual master, that's different. So actually, I don't know if they replayed that or not. But if you take a master recording, so oh, Ice Ice Baby has one extra note in it. That was their whole argument oh, yeah, of why remember, it's not that. not the same. But so then that's an interpolation. That's not a sample. A sample is an actual. Like, you know, Lip, when you hear like, control the, control X control. You know, yeah, right. you'll you'll hear the original master in the the recording. So in the, the first Jason Derulo song, whatever that was, it used the Sia. Yeah, or sorry, yeah. the uh, uh, Imogen Heap sample. Like that's an actual sample in it. That's not an interpolation. That's actually using the recording. So interpolation in is I'm I'm quoting this song, but I'm playing it myself. So Ravel and Tchaikovsky were famous for using the same, uh, you know, trading themes. That would be considered an interpolation. But now the Marvin Tchaikovsky Gaye... from uh, Star Trek. Is yes. that what we're thinking of? Right. And no boy. <laughs> And and think about right now that you have um, 
you have the Marvin Gaye estate suing Ed Sheeran because they won from Blurred Lines. And, and to be honest, they're a bunch of fucking like... <laughs> Attaboy. Gra- get him, Ross. Get they're, him. Go no, get they're, him. Sick they're, him. They're, they're grandchildren who are trying to make money off their, their grandfather. grandfather who <laughs> who famously was also like he viewed it as paying homage but he would take these ideas from someone else and to be honest he wasn't the one playing the drums and in, in yeah. you know it, it's not even him playing the parts that they're Are suing they suing for. anybody who committed patricide? Are they really just going that far down the Marvin Gaye? Patricide? Uh being murdered by your father. Oh. Jesus. Wow. So dark. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're, let's talk we're, about murder. We're running, we're running a little long time here. Oh, yeah. Did Marvin Gaye get murdered by his dad? Yes. I, okay, there we yeah. go. Yeah, all right. Uh, last, last question before we wrap it up. Right. Um, do you think a song has to... Like, do you think a song is only good if it's on the radio? What? Do you think a song... No. Like, but I'm saying, like, you're saying it's only 40 songs that are on the radio and stuff like that. Do you think, like, is, is that... Should people... Should young songwriters use radio and charts as a measuring stick? Um, on some level, yes, because what they do is it, it is so difficult because in the end, fans out there choose you radio uh, record companies can't legally buy those slots. They can open up doors. They can they can show that there's marketing money behind it. So that way, the radio station isn't just shooting in the dark. They can do all kinds of things to help place that song. But in the end, the person listening to the radio station who calls in and says, I want to hear that song again, that's still the person voting for that song. So those songs that get to the top, they're not they're, there they're by accident. Fandered, yeah. they're, those songs that are on charts on Spotify, there's nobody at a record label just constantly clicking on that. There are some other algorithmic issues to that, but that's a, another conversation. Right, right, right. But there, there's no doubt that those songs that, that top charts... They're there for They're a there reason. They're there for a reason. And, and you would find, I would challenge you to find more than five songs that don't follow the math that would be the equivalent of a good illusion and a good magic trick. Outstanding. Um, Wait, oh, I, go one, for it. Uh, one quick one. If yeah. there's a quick, is there like a this secret? A second quick question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, true. Uh, is there like a, are there, are there secrets in music that, that you would only tell other musicians or are there like things that you... Kind of like a magic? Yeah, how magicians well, don't... Well, all... you always hear songwriters talk about math and other songwriters don't uh, always ask us, what do you mean by that? And what it really translates to is I think it's you guys hazing that... the new songwriters. You guys yeah, talk about math. Of, they're, like, yeah. they're like, what the fuck is... What right. math are they talking yeah, about? Yeah. <laughs> if, if you look at... That's for funny because it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's not totally wrong. But if you're in, um, you know, if you're in Nashville... They communicate. They don't do math. <laughs> On the ju- contrary, they're they're the ones. Who no, they are very are, technical. Yeah. Who are who are constantly calling out numbers. They write everything through numbers. Like like one three five progression kind of stuff, or a different kind yeah. of math. No, that's generally right. You know, I mean, that would be a weird chord progression, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> one three five is a weird chord progression. Yeah, that'd be C-E-G. a little weird. Yeah. Well, but it's a one four five. You do a one, four, five. It's probably a, a three is just a weird thing. Is it a, especially if it's a major three? That would really well. A three be. is naturally a minor. <laughs> that's in right. a progression. I'm just saying that's a strange chord progression. It's not wrong. I was taught that that is like a very common chord progression by my because guitar it can teacher. Be. It, it can't be. The, the, that's not the point, really. <laughs> I sure that that is an example of the math. But the idea of math, in my opinion, is how does the melody relate to the in the scale to the chords below it. And if you can start mastering how those how the person hears it, then you can edit your way around you know right. how the you can manipulate the listener. <sighs> Speaking of manipulating the listener, go rate and review our podcast, That's, please. We are that on would Instagram. Be... Uh, guys, should we recap? Let's uh, to review. To review. Uh, don't have an ego. Or if you do, you have to leave the room. You do have to leave the room. Uh, if you want to be a songwriter... Do math. Do math and move to L.A. Uh, if you want to be an actor, take Fountain. Take Fountain. Uh, Ross is manipulating you through audio. He is a, an auditory magician. He is uh, part of the auditory Illuminati. <laughs> um, I found out that 135 is a weird progression. <laughs> <laughs> 
If it's a minor three, we can go there. Um, I was just saying a major three is a little Let's give it up for our guest, Ross Golden. Ross, why don't you tell them about your socials? Oh, man, it's Ross Golden everywhere. <laughs> Ross Golden at, everywhere? At Ross Golden, at Ross Golden, at Ross Golden. And, uh, and, and what's you your go. Instagram for and the writer is? Is it at and the writer is? At and the writer is. At and the writer is. Uh, I am Jonathan Sadowski. I'm at Sadowski23 on Twitter and Instagram. I'm Mr. Travis Clark. Follow me. You'll find me if you want to. <laughs> we are at Quick Q Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, guys, that's a wrap. Uh, I think we could take it again. I want to do a major third progression with a question. Uh, and just try and figure out exactly where that would fit in. <laughs> Quick question.